Good morning, Keel Street. As you can see, we're back in the sanctuary. We're making another move toward getting back to normal. Um, it is a little abnormal still. I don't see any of you guys here, but we're going to resist doing what some of the stadiums are doing and having cardboard cutouts of people just to uh, make it look uh, thickly populated. Happy Mother's Day to all. We are looking forward to being back together. In the meantime, though, it's good to know that you're there. That we're still, we're still a community. We're still looking after each other. We're still connected with one another and with the Lord. And th that's what these moments are for. So let's go before him and read from his word together. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is, is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. That is the prayer of a mother, a mother desperate to become one who hadn't been able to. And she knows that it is only the Lord that can provide. So let's praise him and go before him. How lovely is your dwelling place Elsewhere, better is one day in your 
when your people built the richest, most beautiful house they'd ever seen for you, made of the finest limestone that they could find, covered with the best cedar wood that could be bought, overlaid with gold, made of all the fanciest things that people could bring. They built the house, and in the opening prayer, dedicating the building to you, they said, what are we even thinking? Heaven itself can't contain you. How can a building? They knew that calling it your house is simply shorthand for here's where you want to meet with people. But that was too small for you. Because your vision has always been the kind of intimacy we had with you in the garden where we walked before you and were not ashamed. Where we simply talked together as one friend to another, as a family member to another. And so, Lord, you have made it clear to us that the dwelling place of God is with his people. In his people. We are Stones being made into a temple where you dwell by your spirit. And so, Lord, it's not the building that matters, but the people. But even then, what matters is meeting you. Being with you. And so, Lord, we gather. We gather together with others. In as large a groups as we're allowed. To be together with you to seek your presence, to seek your face, to cry out for you as a desert cries out for rain. And Lord, your temple is beautiful. Lord, when we see people through your eyes, we get a little bit of understanding of how great your love is. You see incredible beauty because just as our mothers shaped and formed us inside themselves, Lord, we have come from you and you designed each of us to be as we are, only perfect. And so, Lord, we come before you looking for that fellowship looking for that love that, that dwarfs that of any mother. The love that persists even where a mother's love would forget. And we already know they don't. So we call out to you, Lord, to join us today, even though you're never far from any of us. In Jesus' name. Jesus conquered the 
love is perfect. We're told in scripture that perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And he has declared this isn't the kind of relationship he wants to have with us. It's one of love where we're delivered from all of our guilt and our shame. Do you understand how powerful that is that there's nothing you have done that drives you away where God can't reach you and bring you home. The only thing that mattered to him was that you want to come home. He's not a kidnapper, not a rapist. He's a lover. He loves for you to simply come, and he can take care of it. And this Jonathan's going to lead us in this song that celebrates the freedom from all the sin and fear and shame that we have had. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. A deliverance Chosen me, love has. 
hands call my name and I've been born again into your family your blood flows through our veins and I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. child that we come before him in prayer. Roland's going to lead us. Oh, 
oceans rise and thunders roar. I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood, and I will be still and know you. What I appreciate about my mom is her unwavering and unconditional love for all of us children. And there are five of us, so it's kind of a lot. <laughs> appreciate most about my mom is her generosity. She's always giving, and um, sometimes even complete strangers, she's always kind. I noticed that about her. And I appreciate that most about her. There are lots of other things, but that's what I appreciate most. What most about my mother is that she takes care of my diabetes in whatever way she can. I love my mommy. If that she makes me happy. Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day! Happy Mother's Day! What I appreciate about my Lola is that she makes things for me with her talent like crochet penguins and she takes care of me. Happy Mother's Day! What I appreciate about my mom most is her willingness to help me read up questions. Happy Mother's Day, Nana! What I appreciate most about my mom is that she's always given us kids the best um, encouragement and guidance, especially spiritually, so that we can be confident in ourselves and know that we're loved beyond measure. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day! Day. What I appreciate most about our mom is that she always makes sure that I have everything that I need, even though sometimes it's more than enough. And what I appreciate about her is her cooking, and how she always takes the time to make home-cooked meals for our family. What I appreciate about my mom is that even though I'm not able to eat a lot of the foods that they're able to eat, um, she still goes out of her way to accommodate for me by setting aside some food without um, animal products, or she even also makes food that's specifically for me just so I feel included and that I'm fed throughout the day. <laughs> what do I appreciate most about my mom? Well, uh, she kept me. You know, she had me when she was single. She could have not had me. She could have given me up for adoption. She had the opportunity to give me away to a family member, but she kept me instead. And that made her life more complicated. It was a sacrifice on her part. Uh, and I appreciate that being being a parent, making sacrifices for your children, that's really what, what being a mother is all about. Happy Mother's Day. What I appreciate most about my mom is how she made every occasion special, including Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, of course our birthdays, and she'd go all out, spend hours making uh, homemade treat bags, party hats, uh, decorations, set the table up beautifully. It, it was just wonderful, and I really appreciate that, Mom, and we love you. Thank you so much. Uh, you have to finish the sentence. What I appreciate most about my mother is... Start from the beginning. What I appreciate about my mom... My mom about time. What I appreciate most about my mom is that she cooks wondrous foods. Yeah, she because she eats foods or because she makes food for you? Me. Yeah. Loka and Daddy. Yes, yes, that's true. Also, she loves me and Ethan and you lots and lots. Ethan, do you have anything else? Uh, toys. Toys? Yes, <laughs> some amazing toys. Oh, she gives you really good toys. That's important. Moms are brave, strong and wise. Strength from within is what keeps her alive. 
When fear is around and unsureness arrives, she questions her worth and she feels broken inside. God help me and give me strength is what a mom cries to get through the day God always provides. Appreciate your mom for who she is, for God loves all his children and she is his. What I appreciate the most about my mom is her unending desire to help her children grow strong. Happy Mother's Day, everyone. I have a confession to make. I, I don't like preaching on Mother's Day. The closing hymn is, no one can stop me if I just want to go now. You know? don't, don't get me wrong, I, I'm not against mothers, and I, I'm not against Mother's Day. I know there's been rumors flying around, but, but they aren't true. Motherhood is a good thing. I'm in favor of having mothers. I like mothers so much I even had one of my own. Okay then, but, but why is preaching on Mother's Day so challenging? Well, first of all, I don't like to preach just to, to part of an audience or part of a congregation. And unless something has changed dramatically during the shelter and at home order, I assume not everyone watching today is a mother. So preparing a sermon for just mothers feels, feels a bit awkward. Another challenge accompanying preaching on Mother's Day is that Mother's Day isn't sunshine and flowers for everyone. You know, there are those who see Mother's Day as a reminder of the loss of their mothers. For some, Mother's Day reminds them of a loss of a son or a daughter. For others, Mother's Day reminds them of the inability to have children or the failure of their marriage. Then there are those who, who are reminded of their singleness and their desire to have a family. Mother's Day can also be painful reminders, again, of, of breakups, of baggage, of pain, all the things that go together with family and life. So for those who carry them, carry with them today a little extra sadness, hearing a Mother's Day sermon hurts more than it helps. Finally, preaching on a Mother's Day sermon is challenging because we often have this image of motherhood that has to do more with greeting cards than it has to do with reality. We idealize motherhood. We emphasize our expectations of motherhood without recognizing the reality and challenges of life today. To put it another way, there's no such thing as a typical mother or a typical family. So a sappy Hallmark greeting card sermon most likely isn't going to be appreciated, helpful, relevant or encouraging to anyone. Janelle Williams Paris, professor of anthropology at Bethel College in St. Paul, made this comment about the state of motherhood today. She said, the fairy tale of marriage and motherhood is just that, a fairy tale. Our, our culture is one of motherhood deferred due to later childbearing, Motherhood disrupted by divorce, motherhood lost by infant child death and miscarriage, and motherhood unachieved due to infertility and undesired singleness. Of course, our culture also includes wonderful families with strong marriages and happy children. The point is that there is not a one-size-fits-all journey of womanhood. And we hurt women in our churches by venerating one path over all others. There's no one-size-fits-all journey of womanhood. But you know what? The Bible agrees with that. The Bible reveals to us all the realities of the human condition, including those realities connected to motherhood. If you look at, at mothers in the Bible, you won't find an idealized dream mother anywhere. Instead, you'll find real people with real lives and real problems. For example, Ruth was left childless and widowed at a young age. Rachel, Hannah, and Sarah were infertile. Eve and Mary lost their sons under horrible circumstances. Then there's the ambitious mother of James and John climbing over all the other disciples to get her sons a prominent position at the table. And let's not forget, or let's not even try to get into the family dynamics of Rachel and Leah. You know, Scripture gives us a glimpse of people just like us. People who are flawed and struggling and searching for strength, for help, for meaning, for love. 
The Bible records stories of, of women from all walks of life in every imaginable circumstance, sometimes thriving, sometimes coping, and sometimes failing. So as I thought about motherhood this week, I wanted to accomplish two things. I, I wanted to give proper honor to, to mothers, and I also wanted to approach Mother's Day with a topic that would not only apply to mothers, but to everyone else as well. So to do this, I, I considered Sheila. You know, as I looked at Sheila, I was amazed at, at how she copes with the busyness of life. She, like I have had, and many of you have not really had the opportunity to slow down during the COVID-19 crisis. If anything, we're both busier. And for Sheila, that means that she's remarkably busy. She continues to look after her mother and she always has a dozen things on the go and every day she seems pushed and pulled in every direction. Now, I'm not suggesting that mothers who have been staying at home have, have it any easier. You know, there's more cleaning and cooking and longer grocery lineups, not to mention continuing to work from home. And, and then there's the challenge of homeschooling and family refereeing. This time at home may have its wonderful moments of connection and reconnection with children and spouses. And I pray that you've taken advantage of this opportunity, both in your family relationships and in, with your relationship with Christ as well. But... This has also been a time unlike any other that translates to stress and challenge and uncertainty. To put it another way, the world at present has no shortage of stressed out mothers. Of course, stressed out mothers didn't first appear on the scene with the arrival of face masks. The Bible is full of examples of stressed out mothers going all the way back to the very beginning. We meet the first stressed out mother in Genesis 3. See what I mean by the beginning? Her name was Eve. And Eve understood what it was to be stressed out. When God came into the garden just after both Eve and Adam bit off more than they could chew. Do you remember what Adam said to God? He said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate it. Now, according to God's word, Adam was lonely and in need of a loving companion, a helpmate, someone to share life with. So Yahweh provided Eve. Yea, God. To Adam, all the need for loving companionship and a life partner translated in having someone to blame. Already Eve's eyes were open to the knowledge of, of evil. Unfortunately, it was evil in her husband. You know, has anything changed in all these years? Wives and mothers are still fulfilling the role of being blamed on for everything. The moment sin entered the world, so did stress. Sin and stress go together. But that's not the end of Eve's troubles because she still didn't have any children. Eventually, Cain and Abel come along, and Eve loved them both. Then Cain killed Abel. There were no support groups, no 1-800 no helplines, no websites, no Facebook groups to process her pain because no one had ever been killed, let alone murdered before. Eve was the first mother to go through that experience. It must have been terrible. How could she forgive Cain? How could she forgive herself? After all, murder came into the world only because sin in the form of pride and rebellion came into the world. And she was a part of that. You know, from the stress of the first mother, we learn that mothers give birth to their children in an imperfect, flawed, tragic world. A world in which their children can become a victim and sometimes even a victimizer. In the second chapter of Exodus, we find another mother who's stressed out. Deep concern and anxiety was written across her face. She, she was in an impossible situation. The children of her people were being killed. They were being thrown into the Nile by a cruel and oppressive government. We're talking about ethnic cleansing. We're, we're talking about genocide. We're talking about a plague of human evil. So she went into her own shelter at home protocol and hid her son for three months. 
Eventually something had to happen, something had to change. So she came up with a plan and the plan began with a craft project because as we all know, all mothers are good at arts and crafts, right? So she worked on a basket made of bulrushes because she was out of pop popsicle sticks and white glue at the time. She, she covered the outside with tar and pitch and put it down among the reeds at the river's edge. Her heart broke as she gently pushed the basket into the river's current. You most likely know the rest of the story. The boy was found by the daughter of Pharaoh. Moses grew up in Pharaoh's palace amid the luxury and splendor of one of the greatest empires that the world has ever seen. Meanwhile, his mother was hired by Pharaoh's daughter to nurse the baby, and she used that time to teach him about the one true God and, and uh, the child's real identity as, as one of God's people. When it came time for Moses to decide, he turned his back on the wealth and the power of Egypt and chose to identify himself with the oppressed Israelites. You can't explain Moses or his decisions or understand the contribute the contribution of his life apart from the story of his mother. When she came to her wit's end, she refused to give up. She kept her faith. She used her creative imagination. She taught her child and even got paid for doing it. We call that being an entrepreneur. The New Testament begins with another stressed out mom by the name of Mary. When Mary was ready to give birth, she and Joseph have to travel 120 kilometers from Nazareth to Bethlehem to register for the Roman census. How do you think Mary felt when Joseph came back with a key to their room and said, I have good news and bad news. The good news is our room has a view. The bad news is that our room also has a smell. You know, it was bad enough that she is away from her home, away from her parents, but this was an unexpected disappointment. In a year or two, she would have to deal with fleeing to Egypt to escape Herod's murderous hand. And then there was the stressed out day when she and Joseph traveled all day long only to find out that Jesus wasn't with them, that he was still back in Jerusalem at the temple. Worst of all, how did Mary cope with standing at the foot of the cross? What was it like to watch your son die under such horrible circumstances? But then her son was alive again. And Mary saw him and spoke with him and worshipped him with the rest of the disciples. Mary knew the roller coaster ride that motherhood is. She, she knew that it, what it's like to weep and to rejoice, to have her heart torn and then healed. Mary knew the, the pleasures and pain of motherhood and she had more than her fair share of stressful moments. So... The question all these mothers had to ask is the same question that today's mothers have to ask and everyone else has to ask as well. And it's just simply this. When you're stressed out, what do you do? If you have your Bibles at home with you, please turn to uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 to 20. Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 to 20. Now, obviously, this passage has an application for every Christian. So if, if you aren't a mother, you still need to pay attention and, and not start counting the bunnies on your PJs or uh, whatever else you might be, you know, counting the, the Fruit Loops in your cereal bowl. At the same time, in honor of Mother's Day, let me reference this passage in the context of mothers. Beginning with verse 15, we read, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. We're called to peace. And be thankful. Let, let, the, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. The first thing Paul tells us that we must all learn to do is to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Okay, but before we do that, we need to ask, what is the peace of Christ? 
In John's Gospel, Jesus tells his disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. The idea behind the phrase, do not let your hearts be troubled, carries the idea of it not allowing yourself to lose faith. Jesus is saying, be determined in your faith and keep on believing in me. Jesus speaks these words to prepare his disciples for the upcoming moment of his arrest and trial and his execution on the cross. The disciples' world was about to overflow with fear and stress and everything but peace. Jesus, knowing that, said, peace I leave with you. It sounds a little strange, doesn't it? Notice that this isn't just any old peace. No, it was his peace. In other words, it was a peace that somehow was different than any other peace. Then he goes on to say that I do not give to you as the world does. Well, how does the world give peace? Well, look around. Scan your Facebook feed. Browse the last string of information on COVID-19 stats. If that doesn't do it for you, look at the ec economic predictions for the next couple of years. After that, why don't you start thinking about the Asian murdering hornets moving into your neighborhood? Just because the media doesn't think we have enough things to think about right now. How does the world give peace? Not very well. But Jesus says that his peace is different. It's, it isn't like the world's peace. Basically, Jesus was saying to his disciples, your life is going to turn upside down in a little while. You're going to be dealing with things you've never dealt with before. But keep believing. Keep believing because guess what? The peace I'm leaving with you is a peace that sticks. It's a peace that lasts as long as your faith lasts. Isn't that what mothers need right now? Peace that lasts as long as your faith lasts? Isn't that what we all need right now? We need the unshakable peace that's only found in Christ. Going back to our passage in Colossians, Paul uses the word peace. And that comes from the Hebrew word shalom. We've talked about this recently in our cultivating series. You know, for the Jews, peace was more than just the absence of conflict. Peace was a strong sense of personal well-being and rightness that, that came from being in relationship with Yahweh. The peace of Christ that he has left with us did not end all human wars, but it did take, it did make it possible to be reconciled to the Father and to each other. And that's why Paul can say that Jesus himself is our peace. Jesus has promised us his peace. A peace that's not like the world's because it isn't based on the absence of stress or conflict. It isn't like the world's because his peace comes from an unchangeable eternal reality. That God loves us. That he has forgiven us. That he's promised to never forsake us. And that he has taken up residence in us. Such knowledge should give us peace. But notice that it doesn't just happen. We know that because Paul says that we are to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. In other words, you must determine to allow God's peace to rule over your anxiety and your stress. It's a choice. It's, it's a matter of the will. It's a matter of faith. It's a decision you make. It's a position you take. For the peace of Christ to rule, we must allow Christ to rule. Instead of fixating on the source of our stress, we must focus on Christ. And just so you know, I'm preaching to myself here. The, the second thing we must do when we get stressed out is to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How do you let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts? By letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. As one commentator put it, the peace of Christ rules where the word of Christ dwells. And what is the word of Christ? 
is, is it the message of Christ, of about Christ? That Jesus was the promised one, the Messiah, the one sent by God to bring life and hope and peace into this world and to establish a kingdom that would swallow up all the world and all the wars in the world and all the strife in the world and all the sin in the world and turn the world into a place of peace and joy and renewal? It certainly is that. Now the message of Christ is the message that one day all things will be made right and that in Christ the Father has already started this work of making things right. And you can find this reality in God making things right, not only in the word of Christ, i.e. the gospel message, but in the words of Christ or the message of Christ. You know, consider these statements made by Christ. They're statements and promises that are sources of peace. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus promised, I'm with you always. He told us, don't be afraid, only believe. Or according to your faith, it will be done unto you. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And finally, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The word labor suggests people exhausted from their work or journey. Heavy laden indicates people weighed down with heavy loads, too much to deal with and to handle. In the original context, Jesus was talking about the kind of exhaustion that, and the heavy loads that, that come from the religious leaders putting the heavy burdens upon their people. But the point remains the same. Jesus is gently calling us to stop doing everything on our own and instead to find rest in him. Who needs rest? Anyone stressed needs rest. I need rest. You need rest. Rest is the best for stress, particularly when the rest is in Christ. Moving on, the third thing we need to do when we're stressed is to dedicate our lives and all that we do to Christ. You know, you need to understand that your life is incredibly important. Everything you do is important to God. Everything. You know, Paul says in verse 17, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Make everything you do an act of worship, in other words. I think it's a fair statement to say that, that most of the things that mothers usually do go unnoticed. There's a million things, big and small, that are taken for granted. A lot of frustration associated with motherhood comes from all the work that's expected, but not necessarily appreciated. But then there is this amazing truth here for us to grasp. Nothing goes unnoticed. God sees everything that you do. He sees it and he savors it and he sees it as a sweet offering of praise. That is, if you do it out of love and devotion and thankfulness to him and to your family. So let your life be an offering. Let all that you do be an act of worship. Let, let it be an expression of gratitude and praise to God. God has help for everyone who's stressed, including mothers. We must let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. We must let the word of Christ dwell richly in us. And we must dedicate our lives to Christ. But notice that all these things are personal attitudes and actions. These are things mothers of faith need to apply to their stressful lives. These are things that we all need to apply to our stressful lives. So that leaves us with the question, what, what can we as husbands and fathers and as children do to help to reduce the stress of mothers? Well, first of all, husbands are told to love their wives and be, be gentle, not be harsh. Verse 19 says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. The Greek word for love here is a word that suggests an unconditional, non-judgmental, sacrificial love. Elsewhere, Paul tells us that we have to have the same kind of love that Christ has for the church. He gave himself up for us. You know, which is, is a love that puts the needs of our, our wives above that of our own, right? 
Now, to me, such love is best expressed in the fact that we take responsibility for the spiritual growth of our family. Too many men think the church is for women and children. It surprises me how many men can be leaders at work and then abandon all responsibility at home. Many mothers are stressed because they want their husbands to lead and to love their family into Christian maturity. And they want their husbands to be spiritual examples. But they must be the right kind of spiritual examples. They're not to be like the religious leaders and the that place heavy burdens on their families. Notice Paul gives a specific warning about harshness, which refers to not just physical brutality, but also to a cold, judgmental attitude. Christ expects that we give our wives kindness and understanding and acceptance, not harshness or critical spirit or bitterness or just attitude in general. Okay, we've talked more than enough about husbands right now. Let's talk about children. Yeah, let's get them. Children, obey your parents. You can reduce the amount of stress in your mom's life by obeying. Paul says in verse 20, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. I know what you're thinking already. Really? In everything? You know? Our lawyer comes out in every one of us when we see that phrase, everything. We can all think of scenarios in which obeying is obeying in everything would be a big mistake, right? We all can see exceptions in the fine print here. I mean, what if my mom tells me to go take a jump in the lake? Does that mean I, I have to go take a jump in the lake? What if my mom tells me to rob a bank or kill the neighbor who lets their dog leave presents on our lawn? When Paul says obey your parents in everything, Paul is talking about an attitude, not specifics. Paul's saying, don't just obey your parents when it suits you or when you want something. Paul is saying that children should have an attitude of being helpful and thoughtful and respectful. Everyone, including parents, wants respect. More than that, parents want their children to learn from their experience so that they won't have to go through the same pains and mistakes that they did when they were growing up. Why should parents, why should children obey their parents? One reason is because it, it, it pleases them. And you want to please those you love. It's as simple as that. It's about relationship. It's not about just responsibility or anything else. It's about love. It's about relationship. At least that's what it's supposed to be about. But more importantly, Paul points out that it pleases the Lord. If you are a young person who has given your life to Christ, then you are expected to be more than just a son or a daughter. You are to live your life as a Christian. And a Christian young man or a woman shares at least one responsibility with their mother and father. And that responsibility is to be obedient to Christ. And being obedient to Christ involves being obedient to your parents as well. Husbands and children, particularly now, in this moment of sheltering at home, do all you can to help, to love, to respect, and to appreciate your mother. Take this time to grow deeper in your relationship with Christ and with each other, and be peacemakers. Help, serve, give, contribute. In other words, love your moms with some of the same kind of quality of love that they love you back. Someone once wrote, A mother is a wonderful creature, constructed almost entirely of love, and this she can express in a million ways. From hugs and kisses and good cooking to patiently listening or stern lectures, strict rules, and the reputed use of the word no. Like snowflakes, no two mothers are alike. But they have a number of things in common. Name anything. A mother can be found washing it, or roasting it, or polishing it, or getting rid of it, or repairing it, or spanking it, or packing it, or teaching it, or redecorating it, or loving it. A mother cares about 
and for almost every cares about and for almost everything. Gardens, the state of the nation, the worn spot on the rug, fathers and children. For these she can do anything, dare anything, and fight for anything necessary for their happiness. A mother is not always an angel. She will often disagree with you, expect too much of you, question your choice of friends, and bring up the subject of work when you feel the least energetic. But she's always ready to help you when you need her. As Christians, we need to continue to commit ourselves to the support of our families. One of the ways we can support the family is by supporting our mothers. And mothers, never forget that Christ is always there, ready to supply you with, with everything that you need to be a godly mother of peace and at peace, even when you have every reason to be stressed. As we move into our time of communion, let me remind you of those statements that Jesus said that should bring us peace. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. I'm with you always. Not till a week from Tuesday. Always. Don't be afraid. Only believe. According to your faith, it will be done. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And finally, come unto me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I want to go back to that one. He says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. When, when did he say that? It was before the cross. It was facing the cross. It was about going through the most difficult moment of his life. And yet there was this confidence that he had already, by virtue of what was just about to take place, overcome the world. It surely didn't feel that way to him, I'm sure, as he spoke those words. It didn't feel that way to the disciples as they went into the rest of that week and saw all the things that unfolded that rocked their world and confused them to the core of their beings. But it doesn't change the fact that he had already overcome the world. And we in him have already overcome the world. And we come to the table recognizing we don't come or overcome in our own strength. We don't get peace in our own strength. The table is a place to find peace. It's, it's a place to find rest. It's a place that we all come to confess our sins. It's a place where we claim by faith the peace of Christ. So leave your stress, leave your tiredness, leave your sins, leave your anger, leave your fear, and cling to the peace of Christ by clinging on to Christ. Grace teaches our hearts to fear. When we're first made aware of the fact that we have broken something un irreplaceable. But it is grace that relieves that fear, just as Grant's been, been telling you. By giving us the peace of knowing that that which was beyond our ability to repair he will, and he can. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught.
chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. We continue to proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. It's an act of faith. It's a promise of hope. It's a place of peace. May his peace be with you this week, mothers. May his peace be with you, fathers. May his peace be with you, people. Your peace, Lord God, help us to hold on to it. Help us to attain it. Help us to to make it our choice to focus on the peace instead of the panic. God bless everyone.